Hi all, thanks for coming. So my talk will be about malware once the clicker starts working. So that's interesting. Hold on. My talk will be interesting where it worked before and now it doesn't, of course. So uh, there we go. It is. All right. So this is where it all started for me, the whole research. And of course, most people know this, right? Where there's all kinds of malware or ransomware nodes that are being used. Some are older, some may not exist anymore, like Maze. Um, but that was primary, the primary goal of my research, and it started out there. So I'm Olaf Hartong. I got announced already. I'm the co-founder of Falcon Force, which is a company in the Netherlands. Um, and I pr primarily focus on detection research, so all kinds of behavioral kind of like detections. Sometimes I still do IR. Um, I never studied anything in computer science. I used to be a documentary photographer, and for some reason I ended up in the security space, and I actually really like it. Um, I have two young sons, which I really love to bits. And of course I like warm hugs, like uh, the frozen Olaf does. So. If you want to reach out to me, these are my contact details. If you have questions uh, and you forget to ask them, it's always always good. So how it really started for me is um, over a year ago, there was this article by Catalin Campanu on the ZDNet website. He now works for uh, for another another page, but definitely follow his work. He does really good reporting. Um, and what they did is they made a sort of dissection between the ransomware that got up, that got executed, but the primary malware that actually got in there. So the initial payloads are usually different than the, than the ransomware that they executed. And what they, uh, what they made is a sort of overview of all the bigger, um, um, initial access vectors, uh, with the, with the malware that was tied to it or it was known to be executed by them. So basically in the end, they had a sort of listing of uh, of all these families, and then sometimes there are some duplicates, but this is a long list, right? So that didn't really work for me. What I usually try to do is visualize it, and then it makes makes it a little bit more readable for me. So you can see all kinds of correlations uh, starting to develop. And this is, of course, a very small subsection of the real uh, the real world. But this was an interesting factor for me to see. Let's see if I can start building detections on the initial vectors that aren't being picked up by the normal AV or the ADRs to see if I can do something with the behavior that might not lead to that ransom stage in the end. So that was, that was sort of the goal of my research. And some of, some of the interesting bits are where Trickbot was using Ryuk and then later on started Conti, which is actually a, a sort of new version of, of Ryuk. Uh, so these kind of things were interesting, right? And then, all that rebranding that constantly happens. This is from uh, from Brian Krebs. And I think it's outdated already because Ramp is now there and there's all kinds of other spin-offs there and they're constantly de redeveloping their, even their brand image where they now are, are using all kinds of fancier, almost corporate-like logos. Um, some of them are interesting. Payload.bin, I'm Dutch. So Miffy is very famous. It looks quite like it. So it's a bit of copyright infringement even going on there. Um, but the, but the interesting bit for me was like, hey, if they rebrand, are they also changing their tactics? And, and are they, how are they developing? And are they cooperating with each other? Um, so these were all kinds of hypotheses that I wanted to, to, to further develop. And in terms of marketing, some of these websites look quite nice, right? It's pretty logo, nice colors. But it's also kind of conflicting where they say, if you're a client of us, but they also mention that they're a cartel website. So, they're not, they're not completely sure what they are yet, but also grief, uh, comes with all kinds of interesting marketing material where they have, of course, very good numbers into, into their direction. But it's kind of weird that they are starting to develop more and more into real like companies. Of course, their, their, their business model is kind of weird, but also they have all kinds of fancy, uh, proclamations where they won't ask us or, or attack hospitals or other institutions. And they have all kinds of sort of company profiles. And they even go as far as, as partnering up with all kinds of affiliates, which is now more common. Um, and, and the weird thing even is they do all kinds of fancy metrics that you can also see at some of the vendor websites where they compare uh, their crypto uh, uh, and their exfiltration tooling against the other ones and how fast they are. And if you don't believe them, you can even download all the samples and do the executions yourself. So it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty weird for me. Um, 
And sometimes they even promise you not to attack you anymore and even provide a list of recommendations that you should improve so that you don't get uh, hacked at least by them anymore. Uh, so I, I still don't know what to do with it. And now even Conti is, is bre breaching into the area where they might compromise a hospital, but okay, they won't ransom them anymore, but they will sell it to somebody else that actually does. So their, their standards are, are lowering, I guess. But back to the, back to the initial vector. So, what I try to do now is, is look at MITRE ATT&CK and see which of those, which of the actor groups are, that are known are actually executing these, these, uh, these uh, initial payloads. And there were a couple of things that are, are standing out for me already, where, where you see there were um, um, 18 malware families before, and we only see a couple of groups being tied to it. Um, and even, uh, uh, not even all of them are mentioned in MITRE ATT&CK. So there's, there's all kinds of conclusions that we can draw from this. So one, one of course is that um, MITRE only processes the data that is publicly reported and actually attributable, which isn't always very easy to do. So that is already a discrepancy that you have to account for. Um, plus that sometimes the, the, the software itself might be a MITRE attack, but there isn't a, 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 a real correlation yet. So assume that, that MITRE is incomplete is probably the, the, biggest, uh, the biggest mention here. Which is fine. Um, they do have a lot of valuable information, but there's always additional research to be done. And if you are able to disclose it publicly, please do so that it can grow and more people can benefit from it. Um, and on the other side, um, yeah, they only update twice a year, so it's always lagging behind. Um, but but in the Conti example, for instance, it's no, it wasn't on the previous slide, but it's actually known in MITRE. And as you can see, there's there's a bunch of uh, techniques that are that are they are known to be using so it's actually already quite visible it's just not tied to an actor group so if you want to rely on the actor group model which some companies still do you might miss some important stuff that is actually going on already and if you then look at this great spaghetti picture it's basically what i did is i visualized all the the software that we have um, and tied it back to the known attack techniques that are are tied to it and then you can see conti over there as well where it's actually there, there are some overlapping techniques. And what I like to do usually here is if I want to develop some new detections based on MITRE attack, I can look at where are the most um, uh, combinations going to that that's more likely for me to build a proper detection on. Or the, yeah, I can, I can catch more with one rule, basically. So that, that's one vector that I can use. But again, um, I need to, if I need to build detections, I need to have data. And you can get that in multiple ways. You can, you can do it on your own by hand. You can reverse engineer it. Um, I'm, I'm primarily a data guy, so I, I like to work with telemetry. So what I wanted to do is look at sandbox telemetry, because then I don't have to detonate everything by hand. I wanted to do it at scale to see uh, also an historical overview over time and a volumetric one. So I don't have to investigate one sample, which can be partially unique or heavily mutating. So I wanted to have a way of doing this at, at a larger scale. So I started looking at public sandboxes. There's, there's a ton of them out there. They're really good, uh, but they're, um, they all have their different ways of working, right? So any run has a free account. Um, they all have a free access account, uh, but they don't all have the same telemetry that I wanted to have. So there, I didn't decide to use those, primarily for the reason that they're great if you want to detonate a couple of files, get the reports, and then look at them. But it's it's quite manual. So most of the API access is actually uh, in the paid version, or the the at least the important bits are. And and as I mentioned, the output per platform is is significantly different. It's like incomparable almost. So using multiple platforms at the same time didn't really scale well for me. And then of course I figured, well, Virus Total is probably the biggest repository in the world. So let's have a look at that. And their API is actually quite verbose. There's a ton of information out on it, which is uh, quite easy to get. You can actually get it for free. Uh, but again, I didn't decide to use that for multiple reasons. So the API, as I mentioned, is amazing. You can download 500 uh, sample or behavioral samples a day, which is quite a lot. Um, and actually, if I found out you can also do 5,000 because they don't really enforce that limit. Probably they will if you start hammering it every day. Uh, but I, I never got to that point. So I started analyzing it. Uh, you get a lot of, a lot of behavioral data. But one of the problems at the VirusTotal website is that they, uh, have, they don't have, to, they have their own sandbox. Uh, 
but there's also all kinds of vendors, as you can see over there, that, that also do that sandboxing of that telemetry. They feed it back into the API, and you can download that. But if you look at the comparison, you can see that for, for one specific sample, there are multiple sandboxes, and none of the data is, is close to even being an equivalent of each other. So some do, do a very verbose the registry read or deletion, others don't even show it to you. And that's the same for the whole, the whole string. And this is only a subset, of course. But these are at least values that I, I find valuable where I look at the command line or the strings or the, the DLLs being loaded, which I can actually utilize in, in building detections. But most of them are like uncomparable. So there's no real trustworthy real source. So I started looking around and I have one friend uh, named Luciano and he has a, a very big cuckoo environment where he runs about 4,000 to 5,000 samples a day. And he has a collaboration with Virus Total, so he, he allowed me access to his uh, cuckoo farm, which he heavily customized to do all kinds of um, uh, sandbox evasion uh, detections that he mitigated. So the likelihood of it being properly executed is quite significant. Um, and the, the cool thing about cuckoo is that it, it also allows all kinds of plugins, so you can even uh, look at the macros, you can decode those, um, and you can log that all in the behavioral platform. Uh, plus, you get all the, the relevant information that we saw before, even API calls, and it's all being loaded. It's all being logged by the same way, so it's all in the same format. So it's 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 quite at least a trustworthy single source for me. I might still miss data, but I, I miss it for everything, um, or I have it for everything. So that that's the good thing about it. Um, so now I had all that access, all that data, uh, and these were like huge JSON files. Uh, so I needed to do something proper with it instead of grabbing. So I, I decided to use uh, uh, Microsoft Sentinel, as it's called now, uh, primarily for the reasons that it's cloud-hosted, so I didn't have to set up a huge infrastructure. It's super fast. Uh, the, uh, their query language is called Kusto, and yeah, I, I work with it quite a bit, also in my day-to-day -day practice, so that made sense for me as well. So it's really powerful. You can do all kinds of SQL-like joins and these kind of things. And it had a nested JSON support with some of the data analysis platforms like Splunk. They sort of do it, but then they st still segregate all the data, so it's harder to uh, to correlate. So these were the primary reasons for me to to, to work with the Sentinel solution. Um, and then you need to ingest it, of course. So there's a couple of ways to do it. You can use normal syslog, but that doesn't really work well for large JSON files because of the the, the limitation of the the length. Um, you can work with the API directly, so you can fire um, immediately with a key to the API, or you can use uh, Elastic's Logstash, which is an open source freely available product, and Microsoft has built a supported plugin that you can actually use for that. And that chose to be, uh, d decided to be the most ideal way of doing it at scale. So that sounded really easy, right? But it turned out not to be entirely easy, because of course every API has weird limits. Um, and uh, Logstash also didn't really work well with large, pretty formatted JSON files because of all the line breaks. So I had to reconvert them into a single JSON blob first. And then I also learned that the API will break if you have more than four layers deep of JSON. So I had to also reformat the data already. Um, then it turned out that there's a 64 kilobyte limit in the field size. So every data entry point can only have 64 kilobytes of data. So that, that's usually enough, right? It's quite a lot of data for one field. But if you look at, for instance, registry reads or directory uh, enumeration attempts, that can be a pretty lengthy list. So that got truncated, so I had to tr pre-truncate that already, split it up into multiple fields to, to at least circumvent that limit. And then if you, um, I've, at first I downloaded like a, a, a year's worth of data and I just fire hose that into the API. And turned out that um, uh, the log analytics API on the backend didn't really like that. So it started uh, rate limiting me with saying, hey, the payload is too large. But that, that should usually be fine. But Logstash can't deal with those, um, those messages. So it just keeps on hammering it constantly. So I had, I had to do it basically at uh, sort of my own rate limiting in there. But in the end, it, it worked out, right? So it was great. I have data now. I, I can actually search through it. Um, the weird thing with, with the log analytics thing is that it, you need to build additional parsers on it. So it, it's actually readable, but uh, they, they make it all into strings and, and integer fields. So you need to make it a little bit nicer. 
I work with Defender for Endpoint a lot. That's Microsoft's um, um, EDR. So I basically build a parser that had the same data schema uh, so that it can easily convert all the rules that I started building on my malware to their, to their platform with only changing the, the schema header fields. So I now have a year's worth of data. Interestingly, the largest sample is 638 megabytes, which of course is an ISO file with a whole uh, um, uh, uh, operating system in there to deploy malware. Um, and the smallest one is only 682 kilobytes, or bytes even. And there's everything in there. So XE files, MSIs, DLLs, uh, all kinds of office documents, weird scripts, ELF files, uh, you name it. So with that pers custom parsing, I had to do some other magic because um, due to the cuckoo nature, you can use all kinds of fictitious usernames, for instance. So I had to transform all those usernames at least into one because I wanted to correlate it across the whole data set. And then you have to do some additional uh, JSON parsing and these kind of things. So it's not that, that difficult. But then you end up with all kinds of malware API call-like events where I can just very easily query that schema and have my own uh, data representation in there. And I can even look, as I mentioned, in, into macro code where you can get the fully obfuscated uh, macros that they're trying to execute and, and even decode that partially within the query language. So it's pretty powerful. So why would I go through all this trouble, you might ask? Because it's a lot of work for maybe nothing, but what I wanted to have is sort of very realistic and actually current vision of what is actually being used by all kinds of malware families, how they operate, how often do they change tactics, these kind of things, but also uh, the which low bins are they using frequently or which DLLs are they using, uh, registry techniques, all kinds of persistence methods. Um, and even seeing how, which, which is the current hot uh, C2 platform, uh, uh, which is, of course, heavily debated on Twitter. Um, so, but even, even go further where I can see, okay, they're enumerating certain, certain directories or certain registry keys all the time. So I might be able to build a, a sack hole uh, on Windows already to monitor that more easily as well, because that's, that's a hard thing to monitor for mo with most security solutions. Even Sysmon can't help you there. So you can build additional visibility methods as well to see uh, what actually they, they are currently doing. And also is, is sort of, yeah, basically anything that I can build detections for. That was, that was the whole the whole effort. So this was a screenshot from yesterday. So currently I have about 820,000, 5,000 samples in there um, uh, spread across over 4,000 malware families. So quite a lot. And I started building some dashboards just to make it easy where I can also see which uh, are the top 10 malware families that I at least have telemetry for over the last couple of months. And that might be different than the, the complete world, right? Because this is uh, uh, only a subset probably. But you can see that the that, that TrickBot is, is quite popular, Agent Tesla. Sometimes you see Cobalt Strike popping up or Drydex. So it, it's interesting to see also campaign-wise that sometimes some groups are way more active than in other periods. And in summer, everybody was on holiday, so nobody <laughs> did a lot. Uh, but also other things. So I can also look at uh, at, uh, at the MIME types, for instance, where I can see a distribution of types of files that are being executed. And so suddenly in October and, and two weeks ago, there was a huge spike in Excel files being used again. So I could look at, okay, which families are now using that way more than, than apparently they do commonly and what is actually they're trying to do. And these kind of things make sense for me so that I can quickly build detections, help my clients. And, and be a little bit more uh, versatile in, in, in these kind of uh, um, detection and engineering efforts. Um, but other things like from a MITRE get tech perspective, as I mentioned before, it might also be interesting where we look uh, on the left, we look at the techniques that are unique to Ryuk. And then uh, um, you can in the middle see where Conti and Ryuk, which is basically a revamp of the same tool or the same family, uh, are using still the same techniques and also stuff that is unique to Conti. So this is based on MITRE attack. So I also wanted to see how this does actually look in practice. So I, maybe for the people that, that are familiar with Bloodhound, um, this is just Bloodhound, but I use it for a different way. So I can, you can use the neo for j database in the back, uh, populate it with anything you like. And I build a custom fork to have my own logos and my own, my own branding and, or my, my own, my own images to make it a little bit more concrete. But it's basically just Neo4j and um, with a nice with a nice graphical representation. So from a from a practical perspective, you could also have a look at all the DLLs, for instance, that are loaded by either Conti or Ryuk. Uh, 
And then we can already see that, that a lot of them remain the same. Well, you can't really see it on the screenshot, but you have to trust me that 30, 30 were the same. Um, there were a couple, I think there were like six, yeah, that only Ryuk used. And now Conti is using 23 new ones that I haven't seen, at least in my data set, that they are utilizing. So that might give some indication that their behavior is changing or they're using different tactics. Maybe they're using APIs instead of direct calls. It can, it can still be anything, but it's already quite indicative that they're constantly changing their game because they need to, right? They, they're getting a dec detected and these kind of things. And that's also where one of the law bins is search util. Uh, Ryuk didn't never use it, but Conti actually uses it to download their second stage payload and then execute that. So these kind of small things are already interesting. If you don't have a detection for these kind of, well, kind of simple, simple um, uh, law bin behaviors, it might be a good reason to now start doing it in uh, just because um, it will, gi it will give you some nice results and it's not really used um, a lot in most enterprise environments anyway. And the same goes for run DLL. That's probably the most, the most popular um, um, low bin out there. Uh, whereas if we look at the, the whole spread from a MITRE perspective, it's only mentioned to be uh, used by Egregor. But if I look at my data set, that's actually not true. And as I mentioned before, it might be uh, uh, that MITRE is lagging behind or that they didn't have any public reports to base it on. But I can also see that Conti is actually using this quite significantly uh, with all kinds of weird uh, file names. But um, so they do. So I, I, I wanted to have a look at it a little bit deeper. And basically the run DLL command line is built out of in, in three sections, right? So you have the, um, the, the process itself that needs to be called and that can be called run DLL32, but they can also rename it or, or even remove the XE. That doesn't really matter. Then you have the DLL or the, at least uh, the PE file that has to be loaded can also be called anything, as you can see already. And then there's a function that you first want to call. Instead of DLL main, which is executed by default, you can give it any, any pointer that you actually want to do. So this was something that, that already is being used by, by multiple families. And I wanted to have a look at, okay, what are the top used for first called functions that they actually use? So there, there's one that is quite, quite prevalent. That's the DLL register server. Uh, there's also a, a sort of test resum something that was only there for one two days and then it completely was gone um, and there was the control run dll one that was quite quite prevalent in the beginning of the year and then it suddenly stopped so i first looked at that and i figured okay i wanted to figure out who is actually using this and it turned out to be only one family that that um, also was quite visible like hey uh, emotet got taken down and you can immediately see that in the in the graph as well where it was actually a couple of days sooner than the tweet, so I'm not sure whether they, they announced it later or um, uh, my, my data source at least didn't have any new samples of them anymore. Um, but it was quite interesting to see. And also, uh, guess who's back now? Um, so a couple of days ago, they, they still are coming back with the same technique, so they didn't even change. Which is quite interesting that over such a long time, they, they uh, 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 still are using that same uh, uh, DLL function. Um, and they're still one of the few ones that use it. There's now a couple of other groups that are that are using it like very sparingly where you see a couple of samples, but it's it's super rare, which is weird because they can call it whatever they want. But still they, they like doing it this way um, and they don't get yeah, it's a very simple detection to build even this. So back to that run the, or the DLL register server one, you can you can see that there's a couple of more groups, most of the groups actually that we wanted to track in the beginning already. Uh, but also Drydex and Zloader sometimes use them. So that was quite interesting to me, at least, to see, hey, wh what is this? Um, so I first started looking at the whole, uh, the whole uh, data set that I had um, and, and started looking at what other function names are they actually calling. So they, they usually do the DLL register server, but sometimes they switch it around and do all kinds of interesting names like mean letter, north course, might cow. So they use word lists probably, right? So that's a simple assumption to make. And sometimes they even do some sort of random strings which are always the same length. So we can we can build profiles around that if you want. But first I wanted to just look at the DLL register server. So I started looking at a couple of client environments to see um, is anybody using this in a normal production environment. And the only thing I came across was a client where they were still installing Microsoft Silverlight, which well, most people are, are at least close to my age, so it, it's very old. Uh, it's a sort of the Microsoft's interpretation of Flash, 
uh, which never got into a real success. Uh, but apparently some corporate application still requires it, uh, even though it's, um, uh, it was killed in 2019. So that was the only thing I came across. So I was still interested, right? So this might be something to, uh, to keep on tracking. So I started looking at uh, the whole Windows System32 directory to see if it is anything that is actually prevalent. So we can see that there's, there's an export function in, in one of the samples. It was actually the only exported function. So that, that made it still interesting to me. Uh, there, there's a better view for you, maybe. Uh, so I started looking at the whole System32 directory. Um, and it's actually, it's actually quite prevalent. So there's 921 DLLs or executables in, in the Windows System32 directory that also export it. But still, I never see it being called under the command line. So that was, that was still interesting to me. So I started Googling. Uh, there isn't a lot of documentation about it, but um, one of the few things I found on a Microsoft website, at least, is that it is um, um, uh, in direct show at least used as a as a com uh, as a com uh, entry point. So then I went in the whole rabbit hole. I'm not really well versed in com, so I had to dig into that into that rabbit hole to understand it a little bit more. So basically, com is an inter-process communication pro uh, um, um, protocol. Sorry. Uh, so so you can set up a com server, and then uh, other tools can actually talk and use that same code base to reuse in, 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 in all kinds of functionality. And it's actually very significant still um, uh, within the Windows environment, it's, even though it's a quite old uh, 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 setup or implementation. But it's also something that can be heavily used for all kinds of hijacking and all kinds of other things. And the, and the reason is, so everything is registered in the, in, or stored in the register. So if you want to instantiate a new COM object, you, uh, you look at the registry and, and basically ask for the class. And basically everything that is read by the operating system, they read from the hkey class root, and then the CLS ID, the class ID, and then there is a GUID, so a global unique ID, that it identifies your, your com service, so to say. But that top one is actually a virtual uh, hive, so a virtual registry hive, which is a combination of the hkey local machine and the hkey current user. Um, and the interesting bit is, so hkey local machine, you need to have system privileges to write to it, so that's slightly more secure. Um, and the HKEY current user, you can just write to as a, as a current user, right? That's hence the name. But the interesting bit uh, over here is that, that the HKEY user always takes precedence over the HKEY local machine, which is kind of scary in a way because you can always override something and the user key will be read. So you can already imagine that you can hijack this stuff, um, uh, which can break, st break things, so you have to do it, not do anything. But it's kind of interesting to see. Um, so, and then next to it, you can, you can, next to the global unique ID, you can also assign a proc ID, which is a sort of canonical name. You can, you can call it anything you like. And this is again something that, that you can store in, in the, in the current user space as well. But generally, uh, within one of those class IDs, uh, you have to uh, use the improc server 32 or the local server 32 to store your PE binary to point it to what should be executed when you want to instantiate one of those COM objects. And while it's very old, I, I still wanted to investigate, so how many COM objects are there if I just spawn a new Azure Windows 11 box? So uh, I started looking a little bit through those hives, and I, it turned out to be 12,000 class IDs that are already present in the OS. So quite a bunch, right? And I didn't do anything. I just Launched the Windows 11 box, didn't, didn't touch anything. Um, and I also started looking, so, okay, um, how many um, are actually pointing to a file that doesn't exist on the, on the disk? So there's already quite a, quite a bunch of them, so 30 day, 37 in total that are being called frequently, um, but don't have a file assigned to it. So just hijackable, just for you to take. Um, and that's on a fresh OS again. So then I started looking with Procman just to see how many of those calls are actually being made within a maybe 10 minute period. And there were like 305 calls um, for different kind of, by different kind of binaries. So it's quite a large set of commonly used binaries. Explorer is by far the most noisy one where they are calling all kinds of class objects that don't have a file tied to it, which is epic for a persistence, right? You just need to assign it a binary and it will co be called every time, which can be noisy. You don't want to have 50 beacons being spawned, so you have to select the one that is actually useful to you. But with some 
like this took me like 20 minutes to set up and research. So if you spend a couple of hours, you can probably find some. But the, the, the biggest lesson learned is, is, is once you start building a golden image, go through it on occasion and filter a lot of those uh, keys out because they, most of the time, they don't have a real reason to be there. Um, apart from maybe there is a legitimate reason, but then one of the installers that you might use will fix it for you. So just get rid of them. So back to that DLL register serve 32, right? Um, so that, that again was one of the things that, that could actually write COM objects. So it turned out to be one of the functions for at least for indirect show, but you can use it generally to, to store COM objects. And in the documentation uh, on the, on the previous page, it mentioned that it usually should be done through the redshift 32 binary, which is also a low bin, but Looking through my whole malware repository, I could only find a couple of instances that are actually using this on the command line. And the only ones that I could attribute or were attributed were APT32 with this weird long stuff. So usually it's done in a different way. So it's either an API call or it's something done by an installer and you don't see it on the command line. So it's also very rare to see. Um, and if you want to learn a little bit more about comms, these, these help me the most, especially James Forshaw and Casey Smith. They have some great research there. And if you want to look into hijacking, that David Tullis did an excellent uh, DerbyCon presentation uh, in 2019, where he also released some tools to make it even easier for you. Um, one of the other interesting websites that I use a lot for, for binary uh, uh, checks as well is the Strontic Exarchlopedia. It's not the easiest name to pronounce for me, but they have a, they have a ton of information about, about all kinds of executables and DLLs, which are commonly seen on a Windows box. You get hashes, all kinds of abuse methods, um, and, and generic uh, command line output. So it's also easy to see what the tool is capable of. But they also have a COM library where they show you all the COM objects and the commonly used DLL names and these kind of things, which can be very useful uh, because a lot of the COM objects don't have a canonical name assigned to it, so it's pretty difficult to understand from a GUID what is actually being done there. So this might help a little bit as well in your research. Um, so, so a lot of things, what, what can you do with this function, right? So you, you can actually register COM objects, you can change it, you can make altercations with it. So one of the things is also a no miter technique, is you can, you can do component model object hijacking or COM hijacking in short. And one of the things that, that at least Agent Tesla is commonly see doing is where they, they actually hijack or override the Google Update service with their own binary attached in that Improc Serve 32 uh, um, location, where they, where they first launch their own persistence methodology, and then, of course, sure, they update Google as well, um, and then override that, that same key again whenever it's needed. But it's a great way to gain persistence uh, or, or get code execution in the first place. So some of the other things that, that they can do is they can enumerate or even change scheduled tasks on the system. They can look at the recently opened files or just do a directory enumeration through COM so you can hardly see any APIs being called, which is kind of nice and, and stealthy. Um, they can also set up their own connection, yeah, sort of sort of interfaces to, to create listeners to, to create some additional functionality. In some cases, they use a very old deprecated um, UCOM uh, connection point, which should be dead, but it still works, even on a Windows 11 box. And then they could use all kinds of other telemetry that I didn't really look into yet, but you can even do all kinds of RPC installer messaging, uh, um, all kinds of um, enumeration tooling, um, even even talking to the to the proxy host. Uh, so there, there's a lot of a lot of still a lot of stuff that I can do uh, investigating this. But what they also can do is um, there's a couple of class IDs that are, are tied to the auto run, so the on, on boot um, um, events. So every time you boot your Windows uh, box, uh, these, these four class IDs are enumerated and everything that is registered there gets automatically um, uh, um, executed. And of course you can see this with the uh, sysinternal auto runs tool as well, but nobody runs that every day or, or very few people do. Um, and you can see that at least some of the malware families are using at least two of those. Um, um, not, not everybody. And generic, yeah, that can be anything. It's not classified, at least by my detection uh, uh, platform. Um, but the other two are, at least for me, unseen yet. So 
going back to that, uh, to that overview, it's kind of interesting to see that quite a lot of the malware that I was first interested in all use this function. Um, and it's kind of interesting to see that only those groups are doing it and not even all at the same time. There was a sort of sequential thing behind it. So for me, it's kind of interesting now, like who is doing this and why are they doing it in sort of sequence? Is somebody doing it and reselling it and reselling it? Or are they reversing each other, which apparently they probably also do? And, and how is this, this being done? Because I couldn't find real sample codes of, of this implementation on the public internet, at least. There might be something on a dark web forum, but I, I never bothered to look that far. Uh, but it was an interesting thing to see, because first we see, we see uh, uh, Cockbots or Qbots or whatever we want to call it. There's multiple names for it, use it. Then they stop using it in the summer. And then after summer or somewhere in the middle of the summer, suddenly Trickbot becomes very active with it. Um, and now um, um, hardly anybody is really using it. So it's only the, 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 the turquoise ones that are highlighted a little bit in September and October, and now it's sort of dead. Um, so it's, it's weird to see um, why these changes are there. Um, some other fun finds I had, um, basically just scrolling through the whole database, is where Trickbot is a known Russian group, and then somebody had uh, all kinds of samples with bear.exe and HTM in there, which I found funny. Um, one of the other things was um, um, I, I started looking at, okay, what what level of profanity is in there. So I started digging through strings and file names, API calls, all kinds of other stuff. And it turned out that that Drydex, uh, within a couple of weeks, was the most, uh, using the most swear words, uh, which was also sort of interesting. It might, might help a little bit in profiling groups um, or not. Um, so what can we do with all this information, right? So, so from a detection perspective, we can we can have all kinds of, based on only this research, build detections on the redshift32 and the run DLL command lines, the functions that are being called, and maybe even go further, reversing them a little bit to see what they actually write to the registry if we don't have that, that telemetry there. So we can also have a look at the registry telemetry. So if you have a proper EDR or Sysmon or something like it, you can also see all the telemetry that they feed into the registry, what they are actually writing, which files they are actually registering. You can pull those and see what it's actually doing. Um, and of course, you can look for anomalous COM objects, which is quite simple in general to do. Uh, if you have a very s solid, well-maintained enterprise, you can, you can sort of profile baseline what is commonly seen there and build some additional stuff on top of it. And of course, you can also start building mitigation, right? So as I mentioned in your role and image, you can unregister a lot of those uh, sort of ghosted objects to at least prevent those from being uh, being reused. Um, you can change the path of the ones that were improperly linked. So sometimes they only use a DLL name to link it, but you can change that to the full path name where it's actually uh, there. So you can do, at least can't do the DLL hijacking methodology of just having it in another directory and probably being loaded uh, with prevalence. And you can also use Microsoft's app control uh, to block some of the known malicious uh, uh, class IDs, which is a lot more work, frankly, but it's super powerful because then it can't even be overwritten from the HK's current user. And from there, you can, you can probably do additional um, um, uh, uh, mitigations where you can start building all kinds of, uh, of pattern uh, uh, base. So in summary, I like sandbox telemetry a lot because I can, I can see new behavior, I can see changes in behavior. Um, I can, I can also use it as a sort of, does this actually happen in the real world scenario where I have come up with a new idea, see if it is already being executed by someone and then maybe get some new ideas from it. Um, but, but this also, I, I need to be aware of this is, this is far from complete, right? This is only the data that actually executes in my sandbox. So if they have better malware evasion that then I currently try to mitigate, it will die and it won't execute whatever it does. Plus, this is only the initial stage. So most of the interactive stuff, if, if they actually, so usually it calls back to a C2. Uh, I can see that, but whatever happens afterwards, when the attacker actually tries to go interactive and starts doing all kinds of other stuff, I can't see that in this data set. I might have another one for that, uh, but that's way harder to maintain. And it's also a little bit more um, dangerous because I don't want to be attributed as running one of those honeypots for them. Um, so that, that data is also missing. So it's definitely uh, just a start. Um, 
But definitely, uh, in general, if you're trying to build detections, never look at signatures, or at least as little as you should. Um, and look more at the behavior. So they, they run something and then probably something runs afterwards, which is more valuable than all the, all the small signatures that, that can help, but they're easily bypassable. Uh, you can even use a different class ID or something else. So looking for a, s s just a single GUID doesn't, doesn't help you a lot. And one of the more generic concepts probably is to know the visibility of your tooling. Um, every EDR has telemetry. Some is really good, some is not so good. Uh, but even the really good ones filter data. So maybe you're trying to search for something that it isn't even logging. So you might have a blind spot there. You need to augment that with another tool or talk to the vendor to actually start onboarding it um, and, and get more visibility that way. And the only way of doing that is just doing it in labs, repeating yourself, and also validating. You can build pipelines for it if you want. Uh, but this is a very interesting bit where you, you, you can't really trust the vendor that isn't disclosing to you what it's actually monitoring. So you need to make sure that you, you know it yourself. Um, and again, attack is amazing. It's really useful as a generic language to, to communicate what is actually happening, but it's never complete and also it will never be because it's maintained by a small team of hardworking people and they rely on public information that is actually fact, that, that, that they can fact check. So if, if I do an assumption and write it, it's probably not ending up there because it needs to be backed with actual data. Um, and ideally, try to build mitigations first before you start building detections, if you can, um, uh, because that's, that's always a more protective measure because they, you stop them in the first place. So that was, uh, that was my talk. Thank you very much for, uh, for being here. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them now or find me somewhere else. I'll be at the armory right after to, uh, to talk about a, a Sysmon tool that I built and a threat hunting app on Splunk. Um, thank you. We have two questions from the AirMeet app. Um, what's your recommendation hunting for anom anomal anomalous com objects? Are there low hanging fruit in an, in an environment? Yeah, the, well, the low hanging fruit is probably looking at, at either uh, overwriting some of the, the known updating services like uh, like uh, uh, Google Chrome or Firefox or some of the other ones where there are, it's quite common for the malware actors to, to make spelling errors. So these are, are quite low-hanging fruit. Uh, and the same for the auto runs and some of these, uh, these quite he heavily used uh, uh, scheduled tasks is definitely one. Uh, so those are the most prevalent, I guess. Okay, nice. And the second and final question. What's the most interesting malware evasion technique you've picked up? Oh. <laughs> well, out of the top of my head, it's probably interesting to see that they... Um, I, I work a lot with the Sysmon telemetry, um, simply because it's so configurable and I can actually determine what I want to see and what I don't want to see. Um, and what is interesting that, that from the whole data set I have for a year now, that almost nobody tries to kill Sysmon in the first place. And even red teamers don't do that a lot. So that, simply, I, my assumption is that they don't want that. They, it's not stopping them from doing what they want, so they don't care for it. Where they do kill a lot of the EDRs with some interesting ways. So they try to kill EDRs or AVs. Uh, sometimes just stopping the service. Sometimes they go a little bit further with injecting into a, a driver and then trying to kill it. So these these are the most interesting ones that I can think of right now. Cool.